want to say first thank you to uh, Stacy and uh, echo all of her thanks um, to SAG uh, and to Baruch for hosting us today. Um, I'm uh, Todd Asher with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, as I think you just learned. And uh, I'm here to facilitate a, a great conversation about production in New York City. And uh, we have a, a fantastic set of panelists with us today who are all very active and successful in the industry, and they're going to share um, everything that they know about production. Production in New York City is a thriving industry. It generates about $7.1 billion in economic activity each year. Um, I want to walk through uh, some of the um, experience that the filmmakers with us and casting directors have um, in, uh, in no particular order here. We'll start um, my order with uh, Celine Rattre. How about I move this forward? So just to my right, we have Celine Rattre, who's a producer and co-president of Maven Pictures. She has film credits including Girl Most Likely and The Kids Are All Right. So thank you very much. Uh, To her right, we have Chimay Karasawa, who's a producer and founder of Isotope Films, with credits including Billy the Kid, which won the Documentary Prize at South by Southwest, and her directorial debut, Elaine Stritch's Shoot Me, which premiered at the 2013 Tribeca Film Festival. <laughs> to her right, we have Ira Sachs, who's professor at the MFA program for film at NYU and director of Keep the Lights On and Sundance Grand Jury Prize winner, 40 Shades of Blue. And to his right, we have Paul Schnee, casting director with credits including New York, I Love You, and uh, Winter's Bone, and the upcoming August Osage County. So thanks to all of our panelists. So first, I'd just like to ask a question to anybody on the panel, which is how you got started uh, in the industry, specifically in New York City. Does anyone have a good tale of, uh, of their first job in New York? <laughs> oh. I can stop. No. Sure. I, I have a kind of um, unusual path into film, um, which stems from my childhood when my father really wanted me to be a banker. And since age two, he's been telling me to be a banker, which really wasn't what I wanted to do. But uh, with family pressure, I ended up becoming a management consultant for a company called McKinsey and basically working for companies doing their five year strategic plans. And I was pretty miserable, but it made him happy. And um, with McKinsey, I moved to New York and was working for t mainly for Time Warner. Um, and in moving to New York, met a lot of people who worked in film and was so inspired by the people that I met um, along the way that I decided to leave um, my, my corporate job. And I started a company 10 years ago making independent films and kind of taught myself as, as I went. And it's really this city and the people that I met that inspired me to, to do this. Should we go to it? Sure. <laughs> Um, I, I first moved to New York after um, attending Boston University's College of Communication, graduating with an undergraduate degree in film and broadcasting. And I got a job as a bartender at CBGB's. Nice. <laughs> and, and set out to work trying to see who was going to hire me to direct a film, haha. -ha. And what I learned was that um, you could sneak in to the NYU <laughs> Film School because no one seemed to recognize that Boston University had a film school at that time. That's how long ago it was. And so I snuck into the NYU <laughs> Film School and I took down uh, listings for summer internships. Um, and then I snuck out <laughs> and I submitted resumes and I got a job working for Richard Brick who was producing a film for New Line Cinema called Hanging with the Homeboys. Awesome. And I spent my first six weeks living in New York driving a 15 pass van because they fired the teamster that was in charge of picking up the talent. <laughs> and I learned how to navigate the BQE from Chelsea, Spanish Harlem to Jackson Heights where I picked up John Leguizamo, Mario Joyner, Nestor Serrano and Dougie Doug. <laughs> that can only happen in New York, for sure. Yeah. And, and I just got off a location van, and I was um, I'm making a film uh, called Love Is Strange that we go into production in two weeks, and, and um, you know, and I'm spending a lot of time talking to the the, the intern who's sitting there, next, starting his career in New York film, and it's I think the thing that I've uh, I've discovered is that. Um, you gotta you gotta make things to be involved in the community of filmmaking, um, and that's from an actor's perspective. It's also from a director and a producer, 
Um, and, uh, you know, I applied. It's also, I think, um, uh, a city that embraces film as an art form. I moved here in 1987, and I uh, applied to graduate school in film to NYU, UCLA, and USC, and I got rejected from all three. And um, I say that because so much of, of any uh, career is about just saying, and next, you know, that it's really about your ability to withstand rejection, which happens on a daily basis. Um, I, but I, I think New York is specific and, and, and unique in the sense that particularly when I moved here, and I still think people hold on to this, it's a city in which film is an art form. And there is some interest in the things you make and the creative ability to take responsibility for those things. So as actors, I think that's also possible. What do you get involved with? What kind of community do you um, participate in? Whose work do you support? Who do you go see? Making allegiances and alliances between other artists in New York is what's gotten me through the many, many hard times that, I, that I've faced, and all of us do. Um, I had sort of also sort of a circuitous path to what I'm doing now. Um, I went to Kenyon College in Ohio, where I studied English. And when I graduated, I moved to New York in 1989-ish. Um, I can't, honestly don't remember how it happened. I got a job in the mailroom at ICM when they used to be on 57th Street and between 5th and 6th Avenues. And within a week or two, I was just, you know, it was one of those stupid right place at the right time stories, um, which I'm really incredibly gr grateful to have experienced. But uh, the head of the New York office at the time was an agent named Sam Cohn, who is uh, just now deceased. And I was working in the mailroom and pushing my little mail cart around. And Sam at the time had two assistants outside his office, and uh, one of whom was going on maternity leave. And I was, honest to God, I was standing right there. And the other assistant said, do you want to work on her desk while she's gone? And of course, I you know, pushed the, the mail cart away. And I said, well, yes, of course. I don't. And so he made the calls he had to make to get me out of the mailroom. And, I, and then this um, colleague of ours didn't come back for, um, for whatever reason for a couple of years. And so I ended up working for this sort of legendary talent agent for about two and a half years. Um, doing everything, and remember this is pre-email and pre-cell phone, so I was on the phone hearing everything and lots of things that I shouldn't have, and um, just listening and learning and learning who everybody was and going to the theater all the time because Sam was had his fingers in the theater and publishing and film world. Um, after that, I also applied to film school at uh, Columbia, and I was admitted. At the same time, uh, Mike Nichols, who was a client of Sam's, lost somebody in his office and his associate producer um, called and said, asked me if I would be interested in working there. So I went to my boss, <laughs> to, to Mr. Cohn, and I said, so I have, uh, I've been admitted to Columbia Film School and I've also been offered a job with, with Mike, what should I do? And he looked at me like I was a, the insanest person on the planet and said, well, it's obvious you should go work for Mike because you'll get paid and that'll be film school, and then you won't have to. And so I, uh, yeah. So I did that, I, I did go to work for Mike for a couple of years, and then he took a hiatus, and um, these are the, this was in the days of overhead deals, remember those? So I wasn't able to stay on because of his, his deal lapsed at wherever it was, and I sort of veered into the book publishing industry where I worked for about 12 years, mostly at Simon & Schuster. And about 10 years ago, through a weird series of layoffs and mergers, um, was jobless and looking around for something to do. <laughs> and through a very strange series of events, became an intern at age 36 at <laughs> the old office of Hopkins, Smith & Barton. Um, and about, I don't know, four years after that, things for various reasons um, came to a head and Carrie Barton and I decided to go off and open our own business. And he and I have been business partners since two, uh, about six years. We all have an office in LA where he is most of the time and I'm here. And that's the, here I am. <laughs> well, and you, you, that's a great history. <laughs> uh, everyone touched a little bit on uh, how the industry's changed over the, the years since you broke in. I wondered if um, each of you could talk a little bit about how your respective areas have changed, whether it's the advent of technology or um, different processes, different um, affiliations. How have you seen the industry change since 
since the beginning for you? Um, I've been making films mainly in New York for the last 10 years and, and things are changing so much and have changed so much over the last decade. Um, and I would say in many ways it's getting a lot harder to make independent films, but there are also many opportunities for us. Um, in terms of why things are harder, um, I, I would say it's, it's kind of twofold. The way films are financed are from um, for foreign, from the foreign market. So you, you get actors and you figure out what their foreign value is. And then uh, the domestic market. And the domestic market is either selling your movie to a mini major or to a smaller distributor and the ancillary value, the DVD value, VOD value. And most of those numbers, both foreign and domestic, have really gone down over the last 10 years. So if you had a cast um, that was worth a certain amount eight years ago and you could get that movie financed, let's say, at five or six million dollars, that very same cast might be worth two or three million dollars today. So there's been an erosion of foreign value. And then on the domestic front, so many of the options, when you, when you had a movie at Sundance eight, nine years ago, you might have had six, seven different offers from distributors, and, and now there are a lot of those distributors are not in business anymore, and the ones that are in business offer you no money for your, for your movie, so they'll take your movie essentially for free. So it's become, and then on top of that, the production costs have gone up over the last decade, and they go up every, every year. So it's more and more expensive to make films, and there's less and less value in films, which, which means it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, but with all challenges, there's huge opportunities, and the opportunities is, the studios are not making as many movies. Their business has really been, you know, when a studio might have made 20 movies a year, they might make eight a year now. And so all this great talent wants to be working and they're willing to be making their films in an independent manner. So as a, as a producer, you now have an opportunity to work with, you know, very, very talented and, and uh, well-established directors and actors that would never have done an independent film 10 years ago. Does the rest of the panel find uh, the same opportunities as well in, in some of the changes in the industry? I mean, I, I, mean I, I can speak specifically for digital video, being a documentary producer and maker. When I went to film school, it was like, you know, Super 8 and 16 millimeter, and we had steam bags and bins and all this <laughs> crap. And the interesting thing to me is that with the advent of digital, anybody can be a filmmaker. Everybody thinks they're a filmmaker, <laughs> whether they are or not. But the most important thing that is still relevant is, are, are you a storyteller? And I actually think the advent of digital video is fantastic because it, it simplifies and makes everything that should be easy, easier to do. You get your hands on a camera, you start shooting something, you know, you don't have to get it processed, you can screw around with it on your Mac. And I think all of that is, it really lends to creativity. And, and you know, puts puts a lot of puts a lot more power in the hands of the storyteller. I right. think, w but the struggle is always going to be: a, what is the story you want to tell, and b, what are your storytelling skills? And it seems to me, even in editorial, and I don't know if you'd agree in in narrative film. Um, I, I was a script supervisor for 18 years as well, but I think the length of time that people take to edit a film is still the same, whether it's digital or or film. Yeah, I, the the general scale of of time and towards of understanding what the story might be seems to be around the same. same. Yeah, finishing a film takes just as long. I mean, I think that what Celine said is true in a way. There's this, there's there's these studio films which mo most of us are not involved with anymore, and that are that are about different things than they used to be. And the the indie has sort of lost a lot of space. But I also think that there's a in New York. I think there. You have to speak about television. I mean, I think television, the quality of the work has gone on so much, and that's actually where the consi consistent jobs are. But there's also, um, you know, I know a lot of my students at NYU, where I teach, that they're really working in the web, and they're making things that are self-made and handmade in a certain way, but they're also um, continuing to create jobs and opportunities for actors because they're doing eight-part series and they're doing them at a really nice level in terms of their, their, their quality. So I think there's new, there's new possibility that's brewing. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, from my perspective in casting, it's not, um, I mean, the, the interesting thing that I've seen is that from just the, the process perspective in terms of how I see auditions, you know, I don't need someone to physically be in New York or frankly in LA any, you know, anymore for a first audition if they're off filming in Seattle or you know, Indianapolis or wherever, they can put themselves on tape or have someone do it and we can still watch it and assess it and then decide if we want them to fly in. But you know, forget about 10 years ago or five years ago, like 
a, a year ago or two years ago, I was getting emails from actors directly, look at my web series. Now I'm getting emails from major agencies, check out our client in this web series. So I don't know what that says, but you know, what used to be underground or grassroots or whatever you want to call it is now, you know, getting sent to us by UTA and the huge talent agencies. That's either a terrific thing or a, you know, a, a, a miserable thing, depending right. on how you look at it. I mean, one of the things I'm thinking about sitting on this panel and looking out in this audience is, is I've been on writer's panels and I've been on director's panels and there's a real, you know, you can really preach the idea of taking an active role in creating your own opportunities. And so what's interesting to me is as actors, how do you do that? Because it's not exactly the same. You can't, um, you know, it doesn't mean knock on the door of Paul Snay and say, hi, you know, it doesn't mean do that in every casting agency. There's a different kind of way that, and I think, I guess on some level, I think it is about though aligning with people that you know and things that are opportunities that are around you and people you think that are talented and, and really building in that core what is, what is close by, not just what is super far away. At least for, for me as an independent director, that's really been what I've had to do. And I, I think there is a way to consider being an actor in New York somewhat in that same framework. And, and when you're looking for talent, what do you look, I mean, half of the audience is our SAG members and, and are active in the industry, and the other half are, are looking to break in. What, what are you generally looking for, and what, where are the places that you go to find good new talent? I'm looking at anybody who feels like <laughs> um, they're qualified. Well, I think the obviously most obvious unique thing about New York is the theater community. Um, I go to the theater, you know, as often as I can. Um, I also rely a lot on reviews and word of mouth. Uh, and it does, I have to say, excite me and make me interested in, in it's creatively gratifying to sort of break out, in quotes, um, people who are well-known or, or somewhat well-known as theater actors who are just amazing but you know because they're always working in the theater never available or you know whatever and being able to put them in a movie and have them you know go to Sundance or whatever and have people say who's this guy and I get to say oh well you know he's been working in you know off-Broadway and Broadway for the last you know 15 years um, that's always fun and I don't think that tight-knit of a community exists in, in LA from what I understand so that's one place. And then, um, honestly, I, you know, the rest of it is basically the old, the system of agents, you know, big and small is still in place and that's still where, you know, 99% of the actors that we end up helping to cast in films come from. Right. Um, I, I would add, I, I agree about the theater talent and that's such a great advantage about working in New York and making films as New York is you get this extraordinary pool of, of actors um, something else that I tell uh, my, my friends or people I know who are, who are young actors is to really get to know the students in the film schools, do their shorts, work as much as possible because that filmmaker may be the next Darren Aronofsky and also you know, doing that work is just such a great way to get experience, to build a reel and that's something that Paul looks at and I look at in, in casting our films. Yeah, you definitely see in, in the graduate schools you see certain actors who just continually show up for, for student films and and they create relationships with, with a group of directors who are ultimately gonna continue to make films. So I, I agree with that. I think one thing um, that I would say is that in casting, for, for me, I agree the theater thing, but also in terms of auditions, one of the things I'm looking for is a certain kind of simplicity in the audition room. Often people come in and they think they have to do something big or surprising or strange or, or really take something really all your, one of the things as a director I'm looking for is someone who's comfortable speaking in front of a camera in a way that's natural. And secondly, someone who is able to listen. It's the thing that I see over and over again in auditions is that people are so focused on their own performance and they're focused on their own lines if they've, if they've gotten sides and that they're actually stop listening. I think listening is really a key to connecting to the camera and, and as a director I look for that. How do you find that the industry, I mean, Celine, you've worked in all sorts of um, places, so do you find that in New York that um, production is different than other cities in the world? I do. It's really my favorite place to shoot. When, whenever we have any script based anywhere, whether it's set in India or in, in California or anywhere in the world, we're like, how can we shoot this in New York? How can we fake New York from for any other city? And we've actually shot 
um, scripts based in Chicago and in Texas, uh, in New York, fairly successfully, although there's always bloggers that say, this doesn't look like anything like Texas. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I love shooting in New York for so many reasons. And, and the first <clears throat> is the quality of, of the acting actors here and the quality of the crew. You, you, I just find, uh, and uh, to Iris' point, people here are cinephiles and they have you know, great taste in, in film and they're excited to be working here. And it's just a different level of energy and, and passion that I find you get from a anyone from the PA to the cinematographer here. And, and that's something that I haven't found in, in shooting in other places. Um, another reason is just the, the beauty of the city and it's just, I, I think, the most stunning city in the world and uh, that's really captured in, in films. Um, the, the rebate in New York is of extraordinary help, you know, and, and because of the gap that I've talked about, about in terms of financing, that it's more and more expensive to make films and it's harder and harder to create value in film and, and the 30% uh, tax credit in New York really, for so many of our films, has made the difference between being able to make a film or, or not be able to make a film. Um, and then generally just love the energy of the city. I think it's a city that makes you want to go and do things. And it's a, a city of very positive people that make no's into yeses and make the impossible possible. So, so it's definitely my favorite place to shoot. <laughs> I mean, I have to say something about, um, I just finished this documentary, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Elaine Stritch shoot me, and, and we followed Elaine Stritch. I don't know if any of you know who she is. <laughs> but she, she, we follow, see, I don't think L LA would have had the same response. <laughs> but anyway, um, we followed her around for a year and a half, you know, with the camera, Panasonic HVX 170, which is about this big. And nobody cared. You know what I mean? We, we shot her in and out of the Carlisle Hotel on the Upper East Side, downtown, Broadway, theater district, in delis, in diners. And everybody just minded their own business. Like this was, you know, nobody gives it, you know what I mean? Which is kind of the beauty of it. And the, and the production value that you get, there's so much information in a frame when you're walking down Madison Avenue or on Broadway or in a hotel or in a diner that you just cannot have in any other city in this country. And it's remarkable how much information is coming across and running into, you know, people she's known from the theater forever, right. and they don't care that you're shooting them either. You know what I mean? <laughs> we ran into Edward Albee on the street. You know, how often is that going to happen? <laughs> but for Elaine, it happens every day. And, you know, every day we'd walk down Madison Avenue, we'd run into somebody, or this person, that person. Oh, this guy's from AA. This person's from somebody else. And it was incredible because, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but I didn't say who they were. Um, <laughs> um, but, but I just think that there's something about the energy here and, and, it, and it's this place where everybody comes to and for the same reasons really, you know, no, no matter what uh, field they're in right. and I think that's, that's what makes it a considerable hot spot. And the other interesting story is the, the, the way that I, I chose, I didn't really choose Elaine, but I think Things happen in the city that lead to amazing opportunities all the time. And I was at my hairdressing salon, and uh, I had worked as a script supervisor for many years, and one of the last films I did, I was working for my friend John Turturro, who was directing this movie called Romance and Cigarettes. And Elaine was cast to play James, the late James Gandolfini's mother. And they had a scene together, and I'll never forget this day. I, I, she came, you know, this hurricane of a woman, and I didn't really know who she was. I, I'm, I'm, you know, embarrassed to admit. And, and she came barreling in there, and she, we did, you know, five takes. And I said to John, you know, what do you want me to do? She's not read the same line twice. She hasn't <laughs> done any of her continuity the same. She takes off her hat and her coat and all these different places. And he said, look, it's Elaine Stritch. You just got to let her rip. And we got to figure it out in the editing room. And that was, you know, a great lesson to learning, to embracing the kind of actor she is or she's become now. So years later, I'm sitting in my hairdressing salon, and I noticed this woman going to the wash basin. And I said to my hairdresser, is that Elaine Stritch? And he goes, oh, yeah, she's a longtime client of mine. And, and I said, wow, that's amazing, you know? And then he said, you know, and by this time I'd been making documentaries for six years, he said, 
That is who you should be making a documentary about. <laughs> and I went home and I Googled and YouTubed her and I downloaded her and I bootlegged everything and I was like, holy <laughs> shit, he's right. She's an amazing character, you know, and this is like such, it's a quintessential New York story. You have these amazing serendipitous events and then they lead to, you know, whatever, a film. And, and you know, where else is that gonna happen? Certainly not LA. Nowhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think in a way what, what um, you both are talking about is that New York is full of lifers. It's like, and I think that's also true about those of us who are, who are staying in the independent realm is that we're committed to doing it and we know each other and we work together. And so my producer now was my intern when he was an undergraduate at Hunter. And it's now 14 years later or 12 years later, however many, and we work together as colleagues and that's 12 years of work. And that also meant in the middle of that, he went off and did seven other films with other people who I'm also working with now. And there is this sense that there is a, there's quite a large group of people who are here and that's, and are gonna stay. And I think that's why Elaine Stritch knows Edward Albee is the same thing. I mean, they were here in the 60s and they knew it and they're still here and I think there is, that continuity is really, really beautiful in New York. And, and something, um, I wouldn't say it's unique because I think every city is unique, but it is special about the city. Yeah, I mean, I can't really, I'm, I'm you know, in casting, we're first in, first out most of the time. When you guys start work, we're on to the, our next job. And, you know, um, so I don't have the same sort of onset experience that these guys do. But from a casting perspective, I mean, there is a different, having worked in LA too, in our office there, there is a palpably different feel when we're casting here. You know, actors know each other, they did a reading two weeks before together, they know each other's, you know, their kids play together, whatever. And not to say that doesn't happen in LA, but in LA you don't, you don't really run into people by accident, I don't think, hmm. because you're always going somewhere with, in a car with a purpose. So <laughs> here it's like you can really run into somebody on the street, and in our office here I've had actors see each other in the waiting room and they're go both coming in for the same role and there isn't a sense of competition. It's like, hey, how are you? Then the, the person say, like, you, you go ahead, I'll wait for you. And then, they person, and then they go off together and have lunch. And you know, I'm, I'm not to say that doesn't ever, ever happen in Los Angeles, because of course it does, but there does seem to be, and again, kind of going back to the theater aspect of it, there's, there's so much stuff going on theater-wise that isn't necessarily work or paying work, but it's community building and, you know, I'll help someone put together a reading of a play and you know, a student somewhere will read The Teenage Son and then you know, three years later, the director says, who was that Teenage Son kid? You know, I have my, fun my funding now and we're gonna make it into a film or whatever. And all of, from an actor's perspective, what I always tell actors is never underestimate um, how, how small really, not to say cl closed off, but how small this world is. Because you know, we just met tonight, but we've already figured out you know, several people we know in common, and I'm sure there are more. Um, so that's another way of saying from an actress perspective, always be nice to everyone. <laughs> because you know, my assistant in our office here who sits at the front desk you know, could be running Warner Brothers in two years. I don't know, and neither do you. And so just be nice to everyone all the time. <laughs> um, I would agree about the, um, the, the lack of competition uh, in New York in a very nice way. I think that what happens in the film community in New York is we're all outsiders and it's a cottage, cottage industry and we're all trying to figure out how to keep making films in New York and you know, how to stay in business and how to continue what we do with the passion that we have for it. And as a result, I think people really, really try and help each other. And whether it's in the acting community or producers, they, they do, you know, try and help each other do what we do because we all feel like we're outsiders and, and we need to help each other out to continue doing, doing what we do. And you typically find that's done through building relationships from having worked with people professionally and talking about ways that you could collaborate together? Yeah, I mean, I, about um, six years ago, I was, uh, between two films and that between took eight years. So it was a long between. And um, it was, uh, and there was a number of other filmmakers that I knew in New York and also internationally who were also trying to kind of get their second film or their third film off the ground. And we, we created a little uh, sort of unofficial allegiance among each other and we called it dependent cinema. 
And, and there was a concept that, that we were, and there were no members and there was no rules, but we kind of took an eye, we kept an eye on each other. And I think what we tried to do is, is encourage each other to ask for favors without having to say thank you um, afterwards. And there was a sense that that was what uh, we got, we all got through those periods and we still do and I'll still call those people and I'll say, and I, by the way, I'll say to a director, what do you know about this actor? All the time. I mean, always the director's the one you go to. They can tell you whether someone works as a day player or doesn't or can be, I mean, the director will, will know exactly what you want to know. Um, you might disagree, by the way, that happens also. But, um, but I think that dependence is actually what you're referring to as we, and, and as a, I'm a producer also, and I feel the same way that Celine does, is that I have to be able to call other producers and say, you know, how, you know, do you know anyone who can help me do this or raise that money or do that? You know, it's you're all trying to work together. And I don't think that's LA at all. Um, I, I, when I first start, started working as an assistant to a producer, um, and then I was on the set long enough to realize that I didn't, in order to be, have the vantage point that I wanted to be, I needed to learn her job, which was a script supervisor, because she mm. didn't carry any heavy cables. <laughs> she didn't have to wear funny clothes. Um, but that job is extremely difficult, as I learned, and I eventually did it for many years and developed, the great thing about New York, I think, is that you develop relationships that really last with the people that you work with, and, and you become comrades. And I met so many, you know, aside from working with amazing directors, Scorsese, Stephen Frears, you know, Spike Jones, Spike Lee, M. Night Shyamalan, you know, every, uh, Jim Jarmusch. Um, you, you become friendly with everybody else, the DPs, the prop people, you know, the sound people. And, and because it's such a small community, you run into each other on the subway and you have dinner and you do all this stuff. Well, one of my very close friends now um, was, was once a DP that I was working with. She still is. Her name's um, Ellen Curis. And we were doing a Spike Lee film together. And at the end of a really hard week, um, she says to me, by the way, I, I have this house in Nyack, and any time you want to come up and just get away from the city, I'm going to give you a key. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell? This is the weirdest thing. But she's just that kind of a person. And years later, when I was making a transition from script supervising to becoming a producer, I had just sort of by accident produced this documentary, Billy the Kid, while I was really meaning to produce this independent film that the financing got hijacked a million times. And we actually finished this documentary in that period of time, and it did really well, and we won all these jury prizes, and HBO bought it. And then friends of mine um, that I'd known as a script supervisor, Ellen Curis being one, she said to me, you know, I've had this footage that I tried to make into a movie for the last 25 years. It was my graduate thesis project at NYU. And, you know, I hired this person and this person. And, and um, she was on her uh, second producer at that time. And she said, you know, I know you've had success with documentary. I wonder if you'd help me out. And the film that I ended up helping her finish was then nominated for an Oscar, and we eventually won an Emmy for it. But, you, you know, not only did she come to me, but my friend Spike Jones came. I helped him finish a documentary called um, um, Tell Them Anything You Want, a portrait of Maurice Sendak. You know, all these relationships that you have in the field become um, not, I don't want to say incestuous, that's kind of naughty. <laughs> What's a better word? <laughs> you know? Supportive. Supportive. Well, Supportive. Communal. Yeah, communal. It, it's, a, it, it's a real community. And I just think that, you know, you can never underestimate where those relationships and friendships are going to take you. Well, would you talk a little bit, you talked about transitioning from one role to producing. Would you also talk about transitioning from producing to directing? And I'd like for everyone maybe to talk a little bit about those transitional periods in their careers. I, well... I actually, I've always wanted to be a director. I think when you've been a script supervisor for 18 years, you're next to a director the entire time, and so you feel like that's maybe one of the roles that you know the best. But actually, I sort of was made to become a producer because people kept asking me, you know, oh, you've worked with so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Who do you think would be a good DP to shoot for so-and-so? Or who do you, do you think that this costume designer would get along with, you know, this person? And, and I just realized by the fact that I had a longevity in doing what I did, I had sort of grown out of the, the all of the 
directors and producers that were being hired were like 10 years younger than me, all these independent kids. And they were asking me my opinion, you know. I thought, wait a minute, I can do that, you know. So I started, people had asked me to start helping them do things, and that's kind of what a producer does, is put everything together. So I, I think that producing happened accidentally. I started producing documentaries and had some success with it, and then actually, I have to go back to Elaine, because she's had such a profound <laughs> impact on my life over the last three years. I, when, I, when, the, when the hairdresser told me I should make this film, I, two weeks later I was having brunch with somebody and I said, you know, I'm trying to raise money for this documentary about Elaine Stritch, but I'm not sure who to turn to. And she said, how much do you need? And, and, I, and I thought, this woman is probably shitting me. And, and I told her, and she said, all right, I can give you, I won't, I'm not supposed to tell the budget of my film, says my distributor, but she gave me literally a quarter of what I needed to make this entire movie, which is a chunk of change, you know? So I just thought, okay, I'm going to start shooting footage with Elaine, and then I'm going to bring in a really great documentary director so we can raise the rest of the money, you know, so people won't think, oh, some newbie is doing this. But by that time, I'd produced like eight documentaries with first-time directors. So, you know... As you know, as a producer, you, you have to coach people along and help support do what they do. And um, finally, when we were in our third week of shooting, I said to Elaine, you know, I, I, I'm going to try to in, introduce you to some directors because I think what we really need to do now is bring on, a, a, you know, an a experienced director. And she goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> and she, she said, you want me to meet more people? What have you been doing this whole time, following me around with a camera? <laughs> and I said, well, we're getting footage together. And she goes, well, what does a director do? And I, <laughs> and I said, well, they would follow you around with a camera. And she goes, well, isn't that what you're doing? <laughs> she goes, why can't you be the director? And I said, I guess I could. And she goes, good, moving on. <laughs> You know, I, I think that sort of, it, it's, it speaks to this, for me in my 30s, I, I think I felt the world was kind of small, and I was trying to just hold on to whatever I had, and that was difficult. And, and I think in a way, when I, uh, in my 40s, which have been a better decade for me, I would say that I, I sort of started to realize that the world was bigger than I expected and thought, and that, that there was something about beginning to say yes to things that I used to very carefully say no to or ponder, and that to say yes to opportunities was um, you didn't know what would happen, as opposed to saying no, which you do know what's gonna happen. <laughs> and, and for me, that's also been about directing and producing, is that I have realized that as a director, I'm actually, I'm my best producer, I produce, I make things happen. And that to sort of uh, accept that position and to embrace it and to not think that there's a parent over there who's gonna take care of me and tell me what, the, like I never think there's a parent anymore, I'm the parent, you know? And I think that's been very useful for me as a director slash producer um, because it's, it puts things in my, uh, it, things seem more possible because I'm the one who tries to, who makes them possible. Again, it's a very interesting question how as an actor you take that concept, and, and I, but I think it's about really, really trying to find opportunities to act, not just to try to act or want to act or think about acting or take a class, but actually to make things. And I think whenever you can step forward and actually be involved with anything that someone is making that you think has quality, which I think is important, it's, it begins, you don't know what's gonna happen. You just don't. So I, I think it's always better to, to try to, the last thing I will say that about that is I think it takes a certain kind of interest in other people to be able to do that. And I think it, you have to maintain your curiosity about the people around you. And that's where this community concept, which we're talking about, comes from. It's like you have to invest in other people. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for making your own stuff, <laughs> making your own work. I think that, you know, the, the web series or the episode, whatever you do that's really great is going to do more for you than the, I don't know how many dozen things you do that are crap because, you know, no one will see them and then you know they're crap and people who worked on them with you know they're crap and that's, that's that. <laughs> but I'm going to remember the one awesome thing you send me or that UTA sends me or Iris sends me or whoever and I think that speaks to 
you know, you know what's going to happen if you turn something down. Um, whereas if you say, sure, I'll try that, who, you know, who knows? Um, I always say that to actors who are actually way more successful to me. I'm like, what are you going to do this summer? Like, you know, you got a month, you know, so there's a way in which you're always trying to encourage people to take risks with you. What else are you, you doing? Yeah, what else are you doing? <laughs> so I think that it's, it's an approach that, that works as a producer also. Celine, how have you seen your um, career evolving? Are there some major junctures after you entered the, the field that you've seen in the last five years in terms of your business? Um, I, I think you know so much is changing. One of the other things I've noticed really is changing is the speed of word of mouth. And um, when I was at Sundance eight or nine years ago, you'd have a movie screen, and um, three or four days later, you had the Variety Review run. And as long as you saw the movie in those three or four days, you, you were fine if the Variety Review was not was not going to be kind. And in fact, we had an experience where um, our, my first film ever at Sundance, the Variety Review said, this movie will have no theatrical life, but could be good on cable, which was, <laughs> which was the most depressing thing ever. But you had that time to make a sale and to land with, with the right uh, distributor. Today, you leave a screening at Sundance, and in fact, even before you leave a screening at Sundance, I, I checked uh, three quarters of the way through a screening um, l last year, actually, at Toronto, and there was already buzz all over the web, and that buzz can be good buzz or it can be negative buzz if, if, if the audiences feel that the movie is not working. And the speed of things, it's just incredible, and it, it really just puts so much pressure, I think, on filmmakers to make great films, and um, it, it's, uh, I, I think in, the, in that sense, it's harder than ever. How do you deal with the feedback? I mean, whether it's positive or negative, does it get integrated? Do you make changes in the work or? Are there things that you do in the future that are different, or do you ignore it and just sort of block it out? I think it's very, very hard when there's bad buzz out there to ignore it because that buzz really will impact the life of the film, and you know, it, it's you know just the, the speed of um, you know. I, I think now people know on Friday mornings when a, a film opens wide by by Friday at noon, people know if it's a good film or a bad film, and that sticks with the life of the film. Um, so, so I think you know it. it we feel that we have more pressure to make good films and we try and actually do more screenings as we're editing films and get feedback from people and I always tell filmmakers would you rather have you know the feedback now even if it's brutal while you have a chance to do something about it or as opposed to this being you know out on the web once the film is finished and there's nothing more you can do about it at that point right though I, th I think in the, you know festivals are crucibles uh, in terms of for filmmakers because you're both personally at stake and, and professionally in the same moment and so it's a very vulnerable thing but I think it's also important for me in those situations you're you you've got to take the long you have to have a longer view than the Twitter feed that comes one minute after your film I mean really that's also a form of, of, of a confidence on some level and also things shift they really really shift and 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 I've I've been in a festival where a film had, has, has been considered more difficult and by the end of the festival it's been embraced in, in, a, in a real way. And I think that there is a sense of, of knowing yourself that's also uh, uh, important. And you don't have to listen to all that stuff. You know, that's not always, I, I think it's, you have to be able to listen to things that you believe in. Yeah, I mean, I, it's the, the, the speed that Salim was talking about, you know, we did a, uh, I cast a film that was at Sundance 2011, I guess, called Compliance, which was a very tiny film that was in the first screening that we were all, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's very difficult to sit through and it. it's very controversial subject matter. And people were walking out of the screening, the premiere screening in droves. And I don't know if anyone's seen the film, but as different things happened to this young woman in the film, like at each step of the plot, like another you know, 10 people got up and left. <laughs> well, you know, uh, New York Magazine, I think, not even really a, you know, a film publication, not Variety or not, you know, picked up on that and did an interview with the director like before that day was even over. And so then it became about the film that people were walking out of. And there was a very contentious uh, Q&A after the first, that first screening. And people were yelling at the director and actors were crying and it was a whole thing. Wow. Um, <laughs> So, you know, the, 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 what was great about that was the topic, you know, it became a, the film, not, not the reaction to it, but the, the subject matter, whatever it was that people found controversial or difficult to sit through, that became sort of a talking point. 
of the film. And so the next, however many, they added a screening at one point, I think, like a midnight screening. No, I just went to the, all the Q&As after that because I wanted to see, I wanted to hear yelling and screaming. And so, <laughs> but it was very interesting to see what would happen. And it was, uh, it was, it gave that film a little, you know, I'm not, who knows if it did more business than it would have otherwise. It still got a very small theatrical release, probably did most of its business on VOD. Um, but I can't help but think that talk that discussion around it, which was really about the topic of the film, which is sexual assault, helped the, drive the discussion, which helped drive eyeballs to the movie. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't have been possible, you know, three years ago, much right. less eight or 10 years ago. I just want to pipe in that I think on some level, what, what I, I, I wasn't disagreeing with you about festivals because they're very painful and they're also very important commercially and, and all those kind of things. But I think it's one thing about New York is that the question of value in this city is different than some other cities. So what is value and what is a good movie? And those are things that I feel like in the community of New York that people are questioning in, in, in varied ways and not just in one way, which I think is, is more difficult, for example, in Los Angeles where value is money and that's its definition. So I think in New York, you know, you can, ha you can be a pretty successful and appreciated filmmaker who people admire and not be commercially successful. So, you know, it's possible. <laughs> and, and, and that's New York, you know, that's New York. And that's New York at its best. It's a New York that, that embraces art as, a, as, a, as something in itself that has meaning and values. But we do think that social media is helpful on the whole, don't we? Uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. In terms of creating awareness about yeah, and the just film. creating community, right. you know, um, I was trying to raise money. I had a in the you know eleventh hour of finishing my film. I I a very important um, investor d d didn't necessarily drop out. He just never dropped the cash that he was supposed to <laughs> month after month after month. So I was emptying my IRA trying to keep the film going and through post so I could get this thing done because we had already got into Tribeca. And I started an Indiegogo campaign, um, just because in Kickstarter, if you don't raise all the money, you don't get any of it. But in Indiegogo, if you raise some, you get to keep it. So I did an Indiegogo campaign, and I had, you know, I raised a nice little chunk of change. And then all of a sudden, I get this phone call from Alec Baldwin. And he said, I saw your Indiegogo campaign, but I'm sort of pissed off that you never called me for an interview for your film. <laughs> and, um, and I thought that was pretty funny that he was calling me to tell me um, that he saw, he heard about my movie through Indiegogo and was calling me, especially because the year before he did reject an interview <laughs> for the film <laughs> via email, but I guess he forgot. Did you remind him? Well, no, you know, I didn't remind him until after he actually right. invested in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> But he's an executive producer now, and that happens strictly from social media, you know. Well, uh, we have some um, audience questions. One of them is about crowdsourcing. So did you, were you able to raise all the funds that you were looking for through Indiegogo? Yeah, I actually, well, thanks to him, I raised more than right. I, than the ask was. Um, but I was looking for more than I, you know, right. asked. I just thought, I'm going to be modest here because I've never done this before. But I raised about half of it before he, he called me, and then he wrote a check for a little more than the rest. Did you get a key to his house in the Hamptons as well? <laughs> no, but I just, I just, <laughs> speaking of social media, I was just did a screening of the Hamptons of the film last night, and they've already posted pictures from le the, he couldn't host the screening because he's having a baby this week, right. but I'm actually wearing the same dress. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if you look at any pictures online, that's, that's the danger of online, is you're gonna see me wearing the same outfit because I didn't have time to change. <laughs> <laughs> but it, no, I think it's a great, I, I think cr not only for crowdsourcing for funding, but just sheer publicity for your movie. Every, we're still connected to everybody that donated five bucks to the film. They all, you know, Facebooked us, our page. They've, they're wearing our t-shirts, they're Twittering, they're talking about it. Last night, you know, speaking of the New York film community, I had done a film as a script supervisor for Bob Balaban, and he showed up last night at our screening. And he walks up to me and I was like, Bob, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean, what am I doing here? You've made this great film and I'm coming to see it. And he already tweeted about it before, speaking of, you know, before the screening was over. So you continually, I mean, it, it's just like this, these recycled relationships that, right. that then translate into something else. I think it's amazing. 
And those of you who are engaging in social media, are you managing it yourself or do you have partnerships with marketing firms or is it ad hoc based on projects? Do you have a, um, do you have a, a process for social media um, for promotions? I mean, you have, uh, yes, I mean, you can't do it alone for a film in a certain way, but a lot of it is actually about personality, so you have to consider, um, you know, I work with uh, an assistant, and I have interns, and various people who kind of become part of the community of my f film and filmmaking who are, who are working, who begin to do things like that. But one of the things I think is most important for me in social media is that it creates uh, an immediate audience for work that actually makes you feel like what you're doing is being seen, which I think for a lot of the things we've been talking about are the possibilities for actors is important. You know, It doesn't really feel, I don't think, to an actor who's got a 50 million people seeing a movie or, or 100 people, I don't think internally it feels that different. And I think what social media is, is possible is you start to create your own audience, and maybe it's just 300 people. Or, 50 people or a thousand people, but you're actually getting this response back, and I think that's something that actors particularly can can utilize. Is is you have a connection and a dialogue that makes you uh, encourages you to keep going. Yeah, one, one of the things we try to do now on, on every film that we work on is ask the actors, you know, what, do you tweet? What do you do in, in social media? And ask them to go through the process of working on the film, the process of the film being released, and really be out there and. And um, it, it's almost become a part of the actor's job is not, not just to do the work, but also to be publicizing, to be talking about it, and to bring audiences to, to, to see it when the movie eventually comes out. Do you find that they do that? S some do. I think, you know, the, I think some actors don't, don't want that to be part of their job, but I, I'd say you know, a lot of the younger actors, you know, we, we just work with um, a very talented young man called Darren Chris, who's on the show Glee, and he has a million uh, Twitter followers, and he was tweeting every day about the experience of making this film. And really, you know, for him, it's a part of his career is also to get people to go and, and see his work. And mm. he's he's naturally good at it. Mm. I'm not on Facebook. I don't want to say. <laughs> and I don't. I don't. I'm not on Twitter either. I mean, I'm, well, I just I'll tell you, I, germane to the topic, I guess is. You know, I, when I was on Facebook, I was getting pitches from actors, mm. and then I figured out how to privatize everything, and it was just, I, from a job hunting perspective of the actor, it was not the right, you know, forum to sort of job hunt, so I just felt I had to take my, I just had to take myself off of it, because I was getting, you know, weird <laughs> messages of, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm crack whore number four on Law and Order this week, you know. I, <laughs> I have no lines, but I'm, I'm in the, you know, I vomit the yellow vomit or whatever, and you know, we watch it, and so it's just sort of, you know. <laughs> and we don't have any kind of company presence on Facebook either. It's just a, you know. So prior to social media, was there advice that you were given professionally from a mentor or somebody in your career development that you still remember, something that was, that was important to you? Um, when I s one wanted to start in film, I went to 20 or 30 people in the film business and I said, how do you become a producer? And everyone gave me different advice. And it was actually really confusing because the more people I spoke to, the more there were different opinions. Um, and I ended up um, being able to get a meeting with um, Mark Gill, who at the time uh, was running Warner Independent. And he said, if you want to be a producer, become a producer. Go and option magazine articles, find scripts, find material and try and get your movies made. And that was such extraordinary advice because it never occurred to me that you could just go off and do that job. So um, in, in the six months that followed, I, I read everything I could, you know, in terms of uh, New York press, the New Yorker, New York Times, 60 Minutes, try to find great material, would go up to the writers and say, I, I have no money, but I'm gonna work really, really hard, and will you give me, you know, six months or 12 months to try and see if I can make something happen with uh, your material and was successful in basically starting a career just uh, ju just through kind of sheer hard work and um, trying to reach out to people. So that, that was the best advice I ever got. It worked out all right. <laughs> uh, Chiami, do you have a uh, good experience from somebody that gave you advice in, in your career? <coughs> um. Other than Elaine Stritch. <laughs> I mean, she's given me so much <laughs> advice. <coughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, everybody just, I think less than advice, just their um, patronage, you know what I mean? Just continuing to see that, you know, somebody that worked in this capacity could be, could right. do something else, just a phone call, 
you know, could you help me do this? Could, you know, what do you think about this? You know, I'd get these <clears throat> calls all the time from people that I had relationships with that weren't necessarily, you know, they were actors or producers or other directors, and um, they were calling me as a person. And, and that's kind of how I, you know, started producing. It's just by helping people put stuff together and then taking on this responsibility and thinking, God, I've got to help, you know, make this thing happen. Um, I mean, only, you know, I, I could talk about her forever, but I remember I was having a really difficult time uh, with, with a financier and trying to decide whether I should move on or not. And, and she gave, she said two things to me that I think really stuck with me. And she said, and, and I think these are some of the best pieces of advice I've gotten in my career. One, she said, Chem, either the circus is in town or it's not. <laughs> <laughs> And she also said that about uh, a guy I was seeing. Um, <laughs> and then the other piece of advice she gives me quite often is when I was asking her, God, what should I do about these investors? They're sort of keeping on the hook and I'm losing all my money. And she goes, in the words of W.C. Fields, fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> and I think those are valuable and very valid. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I moved to New York in 19, a, full time in January of 88, and it was at the uh, heart of the AIDS epidemic. And I actually made a film, a short eight minute film um, in 2010 called Last Address, which is about a group of New York artists who died of AIDS. And um, I went and I shot all the places where they lived when they were dying. So the film is really about the absence and presence of those people in the city and what they gave to the city and also what their, their disappearance, the effect it had on the city. And for me, I, I made that film because I was super aware at, uh, at that age, which was my early 40s, that I had no mentors, none. Um, and I was now a teacher and I was a mentor for many people and students and things like that and I never had any mentors. And you know, I was interested and it was like, oh, they all, all the artists who came to New York uh, 20 years before, 10 years, many, many of them, many who I would never would have known even if they had lived, but I would have been able to follow and observe their career and see what they do and be inspired by it, they had disappeared. So I actually started something three years ago called Queer Art Mentorship, which is a program which pairs and supports emerging and established artists in five disciplines because of that absence. And, uh, you know, so I, I have had a loss of that. I will say Eric Bogosian, who was, I was his assistant when I was young, he told me to stop watching Cassavetes. <laughs> it's very specific. It was very specific, and I, and, and I still remember it, and I, I get the DVD, and I actually I put Woman on the un, Under the Influence on yesterday, so sorry. <laughs> Maybe he was jealous. I don't know. He said, you need to move on, which was true. I, I had, you know, I learned to be a filmmaker by watching movies, and, and some of them I just... Got, uh, you know, I needed to move on. <laughs> I got, I, Mr. Nichols actually did give me one piece of advice. I don't think he knew he was giving advice and I can't imagine that he'll remember the context of the conversation. I don't really either, but in the context of something that I asked him, I don't really remember what it was. I was 23 or 22 and he said, sort of in that voice that he had, he said, well, better late than early. <laughs> And I think that's a great, that's probably the best, like most, honestly, like the most life-saving thing I remind myself of when something, you know, I'm actually co-producing a couple of movies that talk about transitioning into things when, you know, it's very hard to get attention from agents and da da, -da. And when I meet a lot of young actors who are just, you know, if they like, are just beside themselves if they don't get this one job, that kind of long view of better late than early, always kind of sticks with me. It helps me sort of, you know, keep going. <laughs> That's great. I wonder if you could all speak a little bit about um, uh, specifically independent film versus the, the, the studio films and um, maybe Ira specifically in terms of LGBT issues and how they're dealt with in uh, independent film versus a studio film. Amy Pascal made a speech about um, who's the head of Sony Pictures, and she made a speech about how there was the representation that we see of LGBT, gay and lesbian people on the screen is, is too limited and we need to expand it and it needs to be not just the same um, few sets of, of, of characters that we see, even in sitcoms and television, which is 
there's certain set roles, and all I thought was, what's the last film you made with an LGBT character in it? You know, I think there is a lot of, um, I actually think in LA a lot of what happens is that there's, there's an interest in, the, in, in other forms of, of involvement, and that tends to be more philanthropic and, and places where they can, um, you know, LA is a city, I'm not finishing sentences because it's a longer story, but I think LA is a, a city in which people are ruled by their, their fear of losing their job. It's, a very, it's an economic industry and they don't want to lose their job. And I think taking the risk to tell stories that are different is, is potentially, you know, potentially they might lose their job for that risk. So I have found as an independent filmmaker that actually telling um, subcultural stories is, is, has become a form of um, my, my power in a way. I'm the person who's able to tell those stories or is willing to tell those stories and, it, and you become uh, appreciated for that spe specificity. So I guess what I would say in general is, is to, to think as an actor and as a creator about what you know that's, un that's unique and then what you can share that's unique. And for me that's been very empowering within the industry and personally. Do either, either of you have any thoughts on independent film and I guess it's uh, the, the contrast with, uh, with studio productions? Or specifically how New York, I guess, enables independent films to, to be produced? I just think there's so many more stories in New York that are worth telling. Okay. And maybe that's mm. just a personal pre prejudice, but the experiences that you're gonna have here are so unlike anywhere else because of all the things that we've talked about, you know, and, and that people really make their own film communities here with their you know, with their colleagues and their friends and they work together over and over again. And I think that part of the beauty of independent film is that it's usually much more of a direct personal vision right. than, than studio films can ever be because studio films are always made by, you know, committee. And, and the script has been through so many iterations and read and reread by 50 million people and criticized um, before, you know, it even starts, you know, to shoot, they, you go into production. And so many of the amazing independent films are one person wrote and directed mm -hmm. it, you know, and their friend shot it and this and that. I just think that um, it, what we've all talked about, the community here really supports independent film visions. I had lunch with this woman who I probably shouldn't say her name, but she was a very famous actress on a TV series in like the 80s. And she has been living in LA for the last 15 years and, and um, I met her for lunch and she said, you know, even being in New York excites me more as a human being um, and an actor because everyone's got their game on here. And, and you walk down the street and you run into theater actors and, you know, and you just feel like you're surrounded by so much more quality. No one gives a shit what kind of car you drive, you know, what you weigh. Well, may maybe in some professions, but but you know, it it I think it New York really lends itself to fantastic independent film because people really want to pursue a personal vision. Right. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to do with our company is develop great roles for women, and we feel that within the industry, female roles, and particularly in studio films, are often under underwritten and they're kind of an afterthought, and it's not the person who's driving the plot or really who has you know the the meaty things to do and. Uh, although occasionally, you know, there is a female-driven film, and every time, once a year, there's a female-driven film, there's a studio film that's a success, and every time the industry is shocked and, and says, wow, women want to go and see women on screen, and it's always the same shock <laughs> once a year. <laughs> but um, we've, we've really been trying to develop great roles for women, and, and, uh, and, and uh, I think that's one of the things that you get to do in the independent film world that the studios don't do as often. I, mean, I would say yes, there's a big yes but to all of this, which is that this, the, from what I can tell, and, I'm, and casting and not even necessarily things I'm, I'm producing, which are, are two, but I'm on a lot of these conference calls with producers who, and sometimes financiers or producers who then have to go to their financiers, and I'll, more often than not, I would say nine times out of ten, and I'm talking about $750,000 movies, $500,000 movies, there is, Salim was talking about before, the foreign sales or domestic sales, the value of the cast. I'm on these calls or in these meetings where the creative, the best person creatively is, you know, more often than not, not the best person on paper financially. And so I'll hear these names reeled off. Well, this person means something 
from this foreign sales uh, agent. And I think a lot of you maybe you get talk to 10 foreign sales agents, you get 10 different lists of people who mean something in whatever territory they want to pre-sell or whatever. And I wonder how much of that economic model is encroaching on what is or isn't independent where you're not going to get your half million dollars, $300,000, which isn't a lot, unless you can get, you know, whomever. I hear all these ridiculous, ridiculous A-list, super A-list names for these tiny, tiny movies that you know, they'll say, well, we, unless we get that person or someone like him or her, we're not going to make this film. I, I would and, agree with that. You, you constantly get the, well, we'll make your movie with Julia Roberts or Sandra Bullock. And you're like, okay, great. great. <laughs> yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, the only, exp honestly, and the only, the only, and I've been, you know, in the 10 years or so that I've been doing this, in the five years that Carrie and I have been working as business partners, I, I think the one time I can think of where the movie was there and was going to be made regardless of who, who was in it was Winter's Bone, where the money was there, they were going to make it, and it was me and the director and her writing partner slash producer deciding who was going to be in the movie. It wasn't a committee. We didn't have to go to anybody to get approval. And that is so incredible. I mean, that's three or four years ago, and that's the last time I can, and first time that I can think that's happened. I mean, generally speaking, as actors, when you see a breakdown or whatever, the more names on as producers, the more, the bigger the company, I think the more you can safely assume as a big generality that these pressures are on you know, I wouldn't call myself a filmmaker by any means, but me as part of the filmmaking team to get, you know, those names or whatever. I think that's, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's a generalization. But. Um, I just want to say two things. One, and just a little follow-up of this LGBT and gay queer film or, or whatever your story is about gay people, let's just say that, where I, I made a film um, called Keep the Lights On, which came out last year and was well-received, did not make money, which is a big, you can't deny that that's, True. Like you have to accept the economics of these things. But I, I have a new film. It, it's uh, with uh, John Lithgow and Alfred Molina. They play a couple um, who get married and they then lose one of them loses their job and they both lose their apartment and they have to split up. And um, and it's it's actually a pretty accessible, relatively commercial uh, story in terms of its and and it has John Lithgow and Alfred Molina. And I will say that it, as we developed get went to get money for it. Throughout the process, we kind of went to all these film companies who finance independent films, and that tally went was zero, you know, until last week. Uh, the tally of individuals who I also approached uh, kept going up and up and up, and ultimately the film has been 95% fin financed by 15 individuals who care about the story and believe in it. So it's an independent film. It's a fully independent film. It's now a moving, Marissa Tomei come on, it's now a moving train, there's film companies are more interested, but it wouldn't have existed if I had just relied on this group over here at all, would not exist. What's different about, I think, the experiences is I'm casting the film with, with a woman named Amy Kaufman who I've worked with for several films. We're making all the decisions about casting, it's just she and I. We talk about someone, we like them, we don't, we do this, we cast them. I have a friend who's in LA who's casting a movie for, for, for Disney that he's directing. Every part has to go through a committee of six. And if someone in that That's committee all. says, I think he's funny looking, not cast. <laughs> this is a very big difference in terms of what it is to be an independent filmmaker. I can say, you know what? Yesterday she was a Russian woman. Today I'm gonna make her an African man. I can make that change. No one even knows, I just did it. And that really creates a different kind of film. And that's still, in New York, what can happen. So. Great. So we do have a bunch of uh, questions from the audience. Uh, a number of them touch on some of the topics that we've discussed and, and a few asking the same question. Uh, the, the film financing question comes up a lot, and I know you've talked to, about it. Is there a, what do you do when you're shopping around um, a film for financing? I mean, there's obviously setting up something like a crowdsourcing site to solicit funds, um, and you have people that you might go to, but what is, what are the tools that you're putting together, and how are you sort of going about finding people that might be interested in investing in the film? Um, so, what, what, what we usually do is start with the studios and they almost always say no right away because um, generally I think they're not as interested in the types of films that, that um, my company is developing. Um, then we go to um, some of the established finances and they almost always uh, say no. 
And then we end up going to individuals and we have the same experience um, that Ira de described and the individuals um, often say no as well and you have to go to a, a whole lot of them. And you know, the film that I worked on that was the most successful is The Kids All Right. And we got 583 rejections from individuals and from companies. And I've actually kept a spreadsheet with those 583 rejections. And you know that's how tough it was. And it ended, ended up being 15 investors who put in, some of them put in $30,000 each. Um, but, but in terms of the individuals, when, when we approach them, we really try and see it from their perspective. And we, we say, what would make them want to finance the film? And some of that is about the economics and presenting a plan that once you've made the film, you know what you're going to do in terms of selling domestic, selling foreign, and that they're likely to make their money back. Um, and then a, a part of it is also all the intangible um, reasons they might want to finance a film. So for some of them, you know, they, they really love the filmmaking process. They want to be involved. They want to be there while you shoot. Um, and for some of them, it's about you know their daughters working as an intern on the film, or you know any anything that they may want to accomplish from it. And so it's really presenting them a plan that tries to understand what their motivations might be and then answers all, all, all the difficult questions about how they're going to make their money back and um, why, why it makes sense as an investment. That's great. That's a lot of rejections and you persevered. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Tiami, do you have uh, any experience? All, all of the fundraising that I've done for my documentaries and even when I, when I first started my company, I, wanted, I actually wanted to produce independent film. And, and one of the first films that, that came my way was John Turturro. He had a, a book that he'd optioned, written it into a screenplay, and we were trying to raise money for it based on who would play you know, one of the leads. As you know, actors are so valuable, and so you know, at the time, um, Heath Ledger was making Broke Back Mountain, and he was the only actor that John and I could both agree on, and I had this connection, I knew his agent, and uh, you know, I worked really hard to maintain this relationship and get his agent to read it. He said, oh no, we're, all, we're gonna do big movies now. We're gonna do huge studio movies. We're not doing independent films. And I said, yeah, but this is an Oscar winning role. It's like a shoe in for an Oscar, you know? So he finally read it and then he got, and then he said, all right. And he got Heath to read it. And, and the following day he called me and he goes, oh, you, he wants to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got an investor for $6 million. And unfortunately, two months later, Heath Ledger passed, which was, unfor you know, really sad. But but, you know, I, I feel like, you know, for me, that was sort of like the deciding point ending up going into documentary because it took so much time to raise that money, a year and a half of my life, you know, and I was making this little film in the background called Billy the Kid on a little camera, you know, <laughs> DV tapes, and that ended up being the successful film, and we raised money for that by making little trailers and then, you know, sending them to people and eventually getting our investor. But in documentary, you know, the, obviously the budgets are much lower, but it's always been private individuals who you interest with the story or the character. Um, and it's, you know, like Celine said, it's a lot of rejections, but then eventually you find your match, you know, like, and, and they just really get into it, and that first thing helps the next person come, and the next person come, and, and I, I, you know, when, when I was financing um, Elaine, the Elaine Stritch documentary, as soon as Alec Baldwin came on and tweeted about it, the next five investors came, like within two weeks, you know, and those people have already made their money back, because we sold the film when we released it at, at um, uh, the Tribeca Film Festival. So uh, it's always been, for me, pri pr private individuals that have an interest in the story that you're telling. Well, uh, I was just listening to Celine. It was interesting to hear we're, we're you know, on a panel together, but I'm hearing and I'm going like, oh, your experience is exactly like my experience, <laughs> and you're describing exactly as I would. And, and I think that's sort of what we were saying earlier is that you know you have to if you have conversations with people who are doing things similarly to you, you begin to feel better because the challenges are the same, and so you you share that and you feel stronger about it. It's what we're all going through. Um, you know, I think the thing that we're also sort of saying is that you have to look at what is except what is around you, not as what what is like a pipe dream. And I think part of being a uh, a producer of anything is being uh, a realist, which doesn't mean you can't be optimistic or hope or push, but you actually, uh, you know, if I fund my movie with a certain number of individuals, I have to know in a, when I'm writing the movie, what is the potential possibility for me to raise money for? And I have to keep scaling that based on the actors I get involved and, 
and the parameters of the response and the numbers change, but also I need to, to, to really think about who's, around, who's, who's one step or two steps away from me, not six steps. Six steps never works, it really doesn't. So that in a way defines your economic uh, parameters is an understanding of where you sit economically. I think that's very right, and I think as a producer, you always have to be very, very flexible. Um, one of the first films we ever made was a film called Lonesome Jim. Um, it was a script that was written by a young um, writer from Indiana. Um, beautiful script, and we'd sent it to Steve Buscemi's agent, and Steve Buscemi said he wanted to direct it, which was you know, so thrilling for us. And within a couple of weeks, we had an offer from a studio called United Artists, and they were gonna fully finance the film for $5 million, and it was you know, just a dream come true. And um, we were starting prep a couple of weeks later, and um, a week before we were starting prep, there was a story on the front of uh, Variety that said that the head of United Artists had just left the studio. So right away I called and I said, what does this mean for our movie? And um, th his number two said, your movie's not happening. Um, and we had two weeks to find the money because we had um, Casey Affleck and Liv Tyler as our cast, and we were losing both actors if we didn't start prep two weeks later. Um, and we ended up getting an offer from a tiny uh, New York company called Indigent uh, for $350,000. So the budget went from five million to two weeks later we were making the film for $350,000. Um, but everyone stuck with it and the job of the producer there is to figure out well, how, how do you make the movie for that amount and how do you, and we ended up scrapping our production plan. Our production plan had been to make the movie in, uh, in New York, but instead we shot it in Indiana in the uh, house of the writer who'd written the screenplay, <laughs> which his parents um, gave to us for free very, very kindly. And um, we used every location as was written because he'd written it in that town and got favors from the whole community and somehow pulled it off um, for, for $350,000. <laughs> One of the questions that um, maybe you could talk a bit about, and I know you, you gave some background already, is, is specifically where you see um, female directors and the opportunities for them going in the future, and somebody who's specifically interested in becoming a female director. Um, I, I, would, I would say female directors and actresses are in the same boat, where you know it's a tough industry and it's, it's even harder for, for women in the industry. And we've really you know, spent so much time trying to figure out why is it that 5% of the movies directed last year, only 5% were directed by women. It's just you know, baffling to us. Um, I would say for first time directors, you know, I, I find that women sometimes um, might take longer than men to say, I'm just ready and I'm just gonna do it. And I, I find there's something in you know, the 23 year old man who may not know the answers to everything, but he says, you know, I'm just gonna make my movie and figure it out as I go. And I think women can be more um, meticulous in their preparation and, and sometimes might not pull the trigger as quickly as, as men in terms of just jumping in and, and making that first film. Mm -hmm. um, and then as careers go, what, what I find, and this is a terribly unfair thing, is a, a man who's had a hot film at Sundance, if he's taken two or three years to make his next film, that's okay because he's an artist and because you know it, it's okay. And when women have that hot film out of Sundance, if they haven't made their next film by two or three years, pe people seem to feel like there's something stale or maybe that person's difficult or you know there's there's it's. I, I really think that the industry is is, is pretty un, unjust towards uh, female directors. Um, so it's something that we're trying to you know rectify in our company, and we really try as much as possible to work with with female writers, with female directors, and. Um, make movies that are, are female driven, but it, it's certainly you know, not, not an easy thing. You know, I have to say, I just realized, you know, in, in the documentary realm, this was a little different. Uh, you know, um, five out of the six documentaries that I produced, not including my own, this past year were directed by first time women directors. And each sing every single one of those women had made their own opportunity. Had, had said, you know, I, this is a story I'm telling, and just we're just tenacious about it. And I think that there's something about the tenacity of, of you know, committing to a role and seeing it all the way through that they each had. And I, um, 
they, they each gave themselves their own opportunity. Ellen Curis, uh, this, this woman, Ann Buford, who made a film called Elevate about the Senegalese Basketball Academy. Uh, Jill Andrasevic pitched a film to Jonathan Tisch about love in New York City, and we made that film, and it premiered on, in theatrically and on the OWN network. Um, yeah, every, every single woman. And, and then most recently, I produced a film last year for a first-time filmmaker, Sophie Huber, and it was a documentary about Harry Dean Stanton um, called Harry Dean Stanton, Partly Fiction. And, um, you know, to, to, to go off on a tangent again, that, that, that opportunity came to me because I was walking out of the gym and I ran into a DP that I used to know um, when I made a, worked on a film called High Fidelity. This kid, Seamus McGarvey, who was, that was his first American feature, and now he's shooting the Avengers and Godzilla and winning, you know, awards <laughs> for Anna Karenina. And I ran into him outside of um, Crunch you know, on the West Village. And he said, oh, it's so nice that I run into you, Shemi, because my friend Sophie needs a producer for her film, you know, that I shot in my Canon 5D, you know, two weeks ago. And I became the producer of that film. But, but I think as, I, I don't think women can wait for an invitation, you know, to be, to be considered for a, a director. I think you really have to make your own, you know, you have to make your own invitation and, and, and really, be tenacious about it. Well, would you say that there's also questions about racial diversity um, in independent film, and would you say that the same thing applies in terms of, of getting more diversity in independent film? Well, yeah, because in independent film, everybody's basically making their own <laughs> opportunities, you know, I, I, or, or for the most part, and I, and I think, you know, what Celine says has a lot of truth. I think women are, are much more, um, I don't, I don't know how, how you described it, but, but they're a little bit more tentative about putting themselves out there um, or being ready or pulling the trigger, as, as you say. And I, I don't think it's that less opportunities for them exist. I, I just think they're, they're not as used to being as aggressive about seizing the day, maybe. Right. Yes. I think for um, diversity and um, particularly racial diversity within film making an independent community, a lot of the, the challenges for, for we the filmmakers uh, and, and there are different opportunities, they're not the same. And I think it's, it's something that as a director, it's kind of, uh, and I think all of us in a way, it's something you have to be actively engaged in as a concept of, of something you, you care about and not just something you care about from a distance but something you actually can enact. And that's um, a working, work in progress, I would say. Um, you know, I had a, I've been casting a film and uh, my, husband who's Ecuadorian said you know he he called me <laughs> he said you, you don't have enough people with color in this film and and I've I've taken that to heart and it was like actually like it's not just about the other people it's about you so it's been interesting yeah, I, mean, I think from from my from where I sit in casting I if I'm working on a film uh, or Carrie and I are working on a film that takes place in LA now or in New York now or in the you know in the latter half of the 21st century, let's say. And I, we try to make a conscious effort to make sure that it reflects what the location is like at the time that, you know, Winter's Bone is in the Ozarks and it's pretty white and that's just how it is. We work on a film now that is, takes place at Los Alamos in the 1940s. Uh, not a lot of diversity in that world. It's amazing from, and this is just sort of a, for the actors in the, in the room that, um, we put out a breakdown very, very, un sadly, rarely, unless we say, you know, uh, could be African-American, Latino, whatever, you know, most of the agents will not think outside the box and mostly submit white actors and actresses. I, I don't think that's on purpose. I just think that no one's thinking. And so those kinds of things that you describe where <clears throat> in the room you decide what was a white kid in you know in his teens is now an Asian American woman in her 30s. Those often do happen sort of on the spot as we're casting, and sometimes we'll put up a board of all the headshots, and I'll look at it and I'll think, this movie takes place in New York in 2013, and there's, it's everyone's white, and what's going on? So I'm a big you know in terms of the reflection of the world the movie set in, I, I think it's it's imperative, casting for the sake of diversity. I'm not a fan of because then. As a movie goer, just watching the movie, I'll see, oh yeah, there's, they had to get their diversity incentive, so there's that, that guy, and then, you know, and it just doesn't, that's just the, 
I'm that continuity jerk, you know, in the audience who's, you know, <laughs> looking for errors. I, was, I did that professionally. You were the continuity <laughs> jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I just think people also have to remember that you, you, you can make your own opportunities. One of the earliest jobs that I had was driving, you know, this young actor, John Leguizamo, to the set of this Hanging with the Homeboys, which was like his first feature film opportunity, and he was still bagging groceries at Sea town you know. And um, he was in the car when we were driving to, you know, to, to set every day. He was writing the script for which would be, which would be Freak, which is, I think, his first, you know, off-Broadway one-man show. And, I mean, he really, he didn't wait for any opportunities to right. come to him. Yeah. He just you, spelled it right. all out. You don't wait for a moment to ask yeah. you to paint something. Exactly. Right? He, he did. And, and also, I was at the, um, is it New York Stage and Film workshops at Powerhouse up at Vassar. And I just saw um, the Hamilton mixtape, mm -hmm. which was uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda's new project. And there's another person who just did not wait for anything. He had yeah. talent. He applied himself. He knew he had something interesting going on. And he's blowing the socks off of this audience. And I think Can uh, John Kander was in the audience. And some, all these people are coming to see somebody who made something of themselves, right. you know, and didn't wait to be invited to the party. And I think people really have to seize that idea, you know, and, and figure out what it is about themselves that's unique, that they can bring you know, to, to, to what's going on out there. Right. There's a, there's a few resources um, our office offers. If you go to um, nyc.gov forward slash film, um, there's a number of resources. One that, um, in response to this question, that I think is, uh, is great is BWI, Brooklyn Workforce Innovations. Our office partnered uh, with them several years ago to start a PA training program, so not geared toward acting, but um, it's a great organization, it's a not-for-profit, and so far 400 um, mainly young people have graduated, about 98% of them of color, uh, and they're all given uh, paid employment as production assistants, and many of them have moved up the ranks, many of them have entered the union, um, and cumulatively, they've earned uh, over $8 million um, since the program began. So there are different efforts um, to, to help um, with d diversity in the industry. Um, uh, on the casting director side, there's a lot of questions about um, what sort of resources people should use. Uh, For instance, websites. Yeah, I, I think, well, break, a company called Breakdown Services, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, pretty much runs the, the system by which we disseminate information and by which we get actors pitched back to us. Um, they have a, a site for unrep actors without representation called Actors Access, um, which is a great resource. For me, when I am, and I'm just gonna be honest, when I'm looking for something, I did a film called Mother of George that was at Sundance this past year. It was set in the Yoruba-speaking community in Bushwick. And I had to find, you know, as many Yoruba-speaking actors as I possibly could, which uh, it's not—it's not—it's a dialect of Iwo, a Nigerian language, I believe. So I used Actors Access for that because agented actors there were like like five people <laughs> who spoke this dialect. Um, uh, there's a lot of other websites that I personally don't use, and I can't really. Speak. New York Castings, I think, is one. Um, now Casting, I think Backstage has a lot of you know, classified so people doing student films and non-union work and that sort of thing. Um, so anything that you can use to, you know, get your headshot and your reel if you've got one and your credit, your resume out there is 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 worth investing in. I was just online looking at actors and I realized that there, now you some actors are, are get their demo reels if you've got one on IMDb. Mm -hmm. And I used I went to a lot and I was like, why does this person not have it? I mean, it's uh, you know I'm just looking around and I, you know, it's Alice in Wonderland. You're going down this and suddenly you're like, oh, what about this person? Or, you know, so I, I think if you can get something online or your material, it's good to have it there. And does yeah. your does your advice differ for somebody who doesn't have a large body of work? N not, not necessarily. I mean, I think, you know, again, going back to the, what I was saying about, you know, if you have done something that you think highly of and that you know is, is decent quality, I mean, it's, you know, don't film yourself in your living room doing a monologue. I'm not, I'm not, and I've seen this. So I, mean, I'm not, I, I mean, maybe it's better than nothing, I don't know. I mean, you asked 
I don't like agree with that. If the monologue see, is really good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah see, I, I mean, you ask 10 different people, you get 10 different <laughs> answers. I may not respond to that as, you know, it's not my thing, but um, <clears throat> I will say in terms of, you know, everyone having, pretty much having their own website these days where you have your reel and your pictures, I have seen a lot of um, unnecessary clutter on a lot of personal actor websites. You know, you don't need to have your bar mitzvah pictures and, you know, your biography, and, and, and not to get too into the sausage making, but your reel should not have, this is, and maybe this is not in the personal pet peeve realm, but, uh, you know, a, a, a 10 second, or frankly even five second, like with your favorite, you know, REO Speedwagon song and like your name in a nice font and then you're like drifting pictures in and out and then your clip from, from Blue Bloods, I'm not, I mean, I'm not terrible, I'm not that patient, so get your clip from Blue Bloods or whatever it is right on the thing, make sure it's easy to contact you, make sure things don't open in a gazillion different windows, I mean, just look at it from, you know, the person, the recipient's point of view, if it's, you know, I mean, not like a complete Luddite, but if it's, if it's too difficult to navigate um, and not easy to download so that I can then send it to Ira if I'm working with him and say, look at this scene she did, this scene she did on Blue Bloods or whatever, um, just keep it every keep everything simple and you know keep it fret keep it updated because if you've got it on your resume assume that someone is going to go there and so if it's you know got reviews of your fringe show from 2008 and you've done you know four shows at Playwrights Horizon since then I'm going to be like where's her reviews from Playwrights or Manhattan Theatre Club or whatever so and there and there's almost you know with uh, I don't know what the services are but there's a lot of things where you can make your own website that looks good and is free and you can they're fairly easy to maintain. I mean, I update our own company website, and I'm you know, not very good at it, and it looks fine. So I can do it. Right. I'm sure most of the people here can. Great. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Um, I want to thank our panel very much for graciously spending their evening with us.